Hi, this is Chet TV's Book Talk. My name is Garrett Holmes, and I'm joined by an outstanding author, Shirley Smith Matheson. And you have a pretty amazing book for us for today. Yes, indeed. Brand new edition of This Was Our Valley. And I'm sort of under the understanding that uh, there's not just one version of this book. So it's been released a few times. So if you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the history of the book itself, that would be amazing. Okay. Uh, first of all, when we came to Hudson's Hope in the 1960s, uh, my husband worked on the WAC Bennett Dam and I worked for the town, I was introduced to Earl Poland. Mm -hmm. And he had, and his family had come to Hudson's Hope in the 1930s. And he was a very poetic person. He'd written these poems and, and stories, but didn't know what to do with them. And mm -hmm. so he and I got together, I edited some of his poems and stories, and they were published in a book called Beneath These Waters, which means, of course, beneath the waters that later flooded mm -hmm. uh, the Peace River Valley. And so as the years went by, um, Earl had written parts of the manuscript of This Was Our Valley. Oh my goodness, it was on the backs of paper bags. It was on scrap pieces of paper, this and that. So uh, I typed it up, uh, edited it, sent it to publishers and they turned it down saying there's more there is more what happened after the dam was built because earl's part just went to the beginning and so uh, i came in as the i picked up the narrative as the dam builder okay <laughs> and carried on that's very interesting. Now I know that uh, I just really want to quickly brush up on your um, your history with the Peace Region because I know you have very very strong roots in the area. So I was just looking sort of into the the history of where you've lived here and mm -hmm. um, sort of the things that you've done while you were here and uh, yeah, just sort of your history with the Peace Region and the roots that you've laid while you were here. Okay, my husband was born and raised in Peace River, Alberta, the town of, mm -hmm. and uh, I grew up in Manitoba and then in in Central Alberta. And when my husband moved to Lacombe, where I was going to high school, and he was going to high school, there we met. <laughs> and after we married, a few years later, of course, um, he said, I want to take you and show you my home territory. And I had never seen anything so beautiful in my life. <laughs> I was raised by a river in Manitoba, but it wasn't quite the piece. It was called the bird tail. And it was um, much smaller, except in the spring when it flooded the farm. And the Peace River to me just grabbed me. And when we were able to move here in 1965, Bill to work on the WAC Bennett Dam mm -hmm. and me, the District of Hudson's Hope, that was it. Just found home. A found. lot of people do. I found, yes. found that myself. So it's, it's, yes. a, it's a common story, absolutely. Uh, in terms of being a writer and an author, uh, was there a specific time in your life that uh, sort of influenced that? Or is there a moment? Or have you always sort of been a writer or a storyteller? First, it starts with reading. Writing <laughs> and reading go together. You can't be yep. a writer if you're not a reader. Same as you can't be a hockey player if you don't skate. Mm -hmm. And I came from quite a literary family, a farm family, but we had books, books, books. And I learned to read as soon as possible and loved reading and started writing when I was, oh, maybe grade five. And that's what I tell school kids too. <laughs> you know, you, it, whatever you love, it emerges very early in life. I've written many aviation books and I say to the pilots or engineers, when did you get interested in the aviation? Well, I was four years old and I saw this thing in the air and said to my mom, what's that? And she said, airplane, I want to be up there. That's how quickly it starts, your love of whatever you do in later life. Oh, it's beautiful. It's very nice. I really want to talk about uh, the book itself. So uh, for anybody that doesn't know what it's about, um, what sort of things do you cover in uh, This Was Our Valley, sort of in a, a broad sense? Uh, the first part of the book, uh, Earl Poland and his family arrived to, in Hudson's Hope in 1930, mm -hmm. poor as church mice, and they just saw the valley and that was it. So Earl's part acquaints the reader with the beauty of the place and the people and the funny stories and the hardship stories and just brings the reader right into the valley so they feel that they know it. And as I come in, uh, you people now have been acquainted with the valley in its pristine state, put it that way, and I come in as the dam is, the Bennett Dam is starting to be built and before the Williston Lake had flooded the whole uh, trench area. And so 
I just picked it up and interviewed everybody and ev from every walk of life, including BC Hydro, because um, I worked at Peace Canyon Dam and um, my former boss, Chris Boatman, uh, when the dam was built, went back to Vancouver and he was uh, vice president of uh, environmental affairs and mm -hmm. corporate affairs. So I wrote to him and I said, Chris, I'm writing a book about the dam. And he said, oh my God. And, uh, <laughs> but I said, well, people have asked questions or had concerns and I want to pose these to BC Hydro and you can send them around to whatever department would answer those okay. and that will be in the book. So it's yep. not a diatribe against BC Hydro and yep, dams, yeah. it's concerns and questions and responses and let the reader yes. form their own opinion. Well that's very cool, that's one of the things I sort of admired, um, especially in sort of the, n the newest iteration, uh, Site C is obviously a very uh, poignant uh, current issue even now mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things I, I admired was that uh, you definitely do try to grab different perspectives from different areas and walks of life and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, did you find uh, it was difficult sort of finding a balance between you know the two sides or the you know finding different voices and were you able to kind of find a sweet spot do you find in the the newest version of this book in terms of finding those voices that you know sometimes may just not even be heard that often or? Oh, definitely. Uh, interviewing all sorts of people, uh, going into background, uh, just from every side. And there isn't a sweet spot, where mm -hmm. that's an odd word for this dam. Yeah. Um, and when I go to school classes and I talk about my dam book and I say to the kids, I'm not swearing. And someone said to me, if you're writing about dams, that is a swear word. <laughs> and I said, no, no. I said, no, it's a story. It's yeah. a story. And we all turn on our lights. We all use power of every kind. And so where is the, the happy medium? What can you yes. do that is less harmful to so many things? And not only people, but the animals, the fish, the wildlife, the forestry, what can we do? I don't know, but I pose those questions. Yeah, the discussion, I guess, yes, in a sense. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I guess one of the cool things about the book is uh, it's sort of, it's almost 30 years in the making, right? It Just is 30 years, exactly right Exactly 30 years. 89 to, to 2019. To 2019, I was a girl <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote that book. Yeah. So <laughs> I imagine there's lots of really, um, interesting and intriguing stories, you know, especially to people in the piece, in the, in the book. Are there any sort of favorite stories that um, you sort of remember hearing when you were doing your research or doing your discussions with people in the community? Are there any stories that so or sort of stick out to you that uh, you sort of remember from the book? Well, certainly. Um, the cover of the book, uh, the beautiful photograph, uh, it was done by Steve Godsman, and Steve and Troy Godsman live on the south side of the river, right across the river from Hudson's Hope. Mm -hmm. They have 60 acres of deeded land over there, which will be flooded, of course, by the mm -hmm. reservoir. And so their story is very, very interesting. Uh, the beautiful vegetables they grow, there's a picture in the book of a cabbage with the man's hand in front of it and the, ha the hand is dwarfed by the size of the vegetables. Oh, they're, they're, yep. It's such a wonderful growing area, yep. much of which will be uh, flooded. Mm -hmm. And uh, the First Nations people have fantastic stories. Uh, fantastic meaning, uh, st uh, how do you say, exceptional on both sides. Yeah. Yes, they, they grieve mm -hmm. this episode. They grieve the, the Williston Lake and still grieve it because it's still sloughing, still mm -hmm. sloughing 50 years later. Yeah. And the, the artifacts, their homes, uh, the ranchers, the business people, it's, uh, it's a, lo a lot of uh, trauma has occurred because mm -hmm. of the dams. Absolutely, yeah. And a lot of electricity has been produced. Mm -hmm. Take a look at the river right now as you cross the bridge to Hudson's Hope. It's like Peace Creek. Yep. And uh, then all of a sudden it will flood. And as you know, um, BC Hydro has sirens to warn people if they're going to be uh, opening the, the gates and putting more water through. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people don't obey those sirens and that happened just two weeks ago, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And uh, a person was uh, is not yet yet been found, put it yes, that way. Yeah. And so it, it's a, a very, very big thing that they that has mm -hmm. happened to the whole ecology. Yep. The social, the ecological, 
the environmental, mm -hmm. all has been affected. Yeah, I guess uh, sort of looking back to the WAC and then the Peace Canyon, do you find uh, that perspectives change over time at all? Like, do you find that sort of the initial perspectives people have, do they sort of change over time or do you find that they generally tend to stay the same or? Well, in some cases, it's ex acceptance comes, you know, you first. You have to, yeah. Well, with any yeah. trauma, first comes disbelief, protest, uh, then, you know, anger, perhaps, or acquiescence, and, and finally, acceptance, and how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to get around it? Mm -hmm. um, so, I suppose you go through, like any grieving process, you know, you go through these stages and phases, but with the third dam, it, it just started all over again. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, on BC Hydro's books, there's uh, even more. Uh, whether it'll ever come to fruition, the one in Dunvegan called Site E. I don't know what Site D is, because mm -hmm. we got uh, the four. But, so when does it end? Uh, someone told mm -hmm. me, as long as there's an engineer alive, he'll find a way to dam a river. And, yeah. uh, you know, and they don't live beneath the dam. Yeah. They don't live beneath the bridge. Mm -hmm. It's job done, on time, on budget, gone next. Yeah. And uh, so, but the people are still here, the animals, some of them, are still here. Mm -hmm. As Ross Peck said, there'll still be animals around after Site C, but it's really ripping the core out of the valley. Absolutely. Well, I was also wondering, um, in terms of Site C, the, the newest sort of um, addition to this book, um, were there anybody or any specific people that you sort of uh, looked looked towards to talk to? Was there any sort of um, specific people that you wanted to um, gain perspective of for this uh, newest version of the book? Well, local residents put it that way. Ken and Arlene Boone have been very much affected, and they have done a fantastic job of spreading the news, uh, gathering every uh, newspaper article, uh, whatever, uh, and sending them out to mm -hmm. everyone. I might get two or three emails a day that uh, has articles that have been written or perspectives or discoveries or statistics. Uh, I get statistics of uh, on month by month uh, the, the dam, uh, how many employees have been added, mm -hmm. how, what stage they're at, you know, BC Hydro sends me stuff also. Mm -hmm. And so the Boons very much have, uh, of how do you say, broadcasted the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. And so their story is very important. And one story that's very exciting and interesting was the protest went to the point of saying, okay, we need money to put forth our protests, so buy a stake in the peace. And for a hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and you get a tax receipt for it, people would have their names put on a yellow stake, mm -hmm. like a survey stake, big yep. tall survey stake. And they, they must have raised well, $15,000 or so yep. on this. And one of the stakes, of course, was signed by now Premier John Horgan. All right. Who was wow. protesting the dam. He was signing his yeah. $100 and his stake in the piece mm -hmm. and two or three other um, MPs that are, are, are MLAs, I should say, from British Columbia. And so Chief Roland Wilson and some others mm -hmm. from the Prophet, Nation, uh, Prophet River First Nations, West Moberly, uh, went to Victoria just this past January mm -hmm. with these stakes with their names and stuck them in the grounds of the Legislative Assembly yeah. and yeah. said, here you go, uh, because you have changed your mind and changed your opinion and let a lot of people down who voted for you believing in what you said before you were elected and then you turned around. So here's your stakes and here is the $300 back mm -hmm. because you're going to need it for this boondoggle, this folly that's called Sight C. Wow, that's an, that's an incredible story. It's a good story. It's, it's not a good story, it's a well, sad story. Well, no, it's, it's but, just, yeah, it's yeah, very interesting but, how those things oh, tend yeah. to go and how th quickly things can turn, mm -hmm. especially when you become, you know, in John Horgan's case, you become, oh. you know, the new And they thought Andrew Re leader. Weaver, yeah. too, uh, as a, the Green Party of British Columbia, would be, you know, mm -hmm. against Site C, but uh, he acquiesced with, mm -hmm. the, with Horgan, and so 
it's a go-ahead. Yep. And I quote Christy Clark, everybody has quoted her, mm -hmm. saying, you know, when the election was coming up, this dam is going to be beyond the point of no return mm -hmm. before the election. And poof, you know. But the price has escalated. The yeah. people in BC, you people are going to be paying mega taxes because it's going to be quite a, as Chief Roland Wilson said, you're going to need this $300 yeah. to help you out a little bit. You know. I understand. Well, actually, that actually leads me into a new question. Um, you know, as a younger person, I obviously wasn't around for the Peace Canyon and um, the WAC. Did you find, like, at the time that there was sort of a similar level of, uh, I guess, political intrigue when those dams were going up? Was there sort of this, the same level of, of protest or public uh, pushback? Or? Um, maybe not, because nobody knew the harm mm -hmm. that was going to be caused by flooding. Uh, the, in the trench, 640 square miles of land was flooded horribly. Yep. And you know where the Finley comes down from the north and the, and the uh, Parsnip from the south and they join together and do a phenomenal thing. They crash through the Rocky Mountains to form the Peace River mm -hmm. and that whole trench is flooded. And not just a nice little marina lake, that's what they thought. The debris, because they couldn't uh, deforest that whole 640 square miles you know of cliffs and valleys and creeks and rivers and all sorts of things and so the debris was incredible and these trees uh, as they the earth softened underneath them would pop up and call deadheads mm -hmm. and uh, they'd float some of them just beneath the surface or the branches or whatever and I quote Penn Powell, uh, he's passed away now, Hudson's Hope uh, resident, Charlie Lake and Hudson's Hope. And he, in, he used to uh, go over the Peace River and, and just beautiful place. You could go anywhere in boats or, or aircraft and land right at people's doors, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, after the devastation, uh, he said it was just, he'd fly over it every day that was flyable, and he said, the things I saw, I often wished I could forget. Mm -hmm. Like a hundred moose that they would count, trying to make their way through the debris, and they'd fly the next day and there'd be none left. They're gone. Because oh they goodness. couldn't, the debris was, hor like one logger said, you could walk across that lake blindfolded on wood. Yep. It was such a mess, and it's the debris continues, the sloughing continues. The First Nations people, the Sikani, Sikan, Sikani Dean, they, they, their places at Fort Graham were flooded. They're, they, they moved to the Injunica. They were told to move to the Injunica. They started their new graveyard. Pretty soon, the graveyard is flooded, and you know what happens when a graveyard floods. It, the coffins yeah. fall into the lake <laughs> yes, and this yeah. is devastating this is a, such a desecration of their of their mm -hmm. dead and the anger that resulted for this kind of thing has never been forgotten yep. some have taken monetary appeasements because hydro certainly acknowledged their dark past they've said that in writing their dark past in dealing with the first nations and in dealing with the the other settlers too in the valley yep. the small amount of monetary compensation they got for their ranches and farms and uh, for the First Nations for sure. And uh, so monetary, well, I guess it helps build new communities sort of thing, but yeah. the memories remain and it's not that old of a memory. Fifty years isn't that long. It's not, long, it's not very long no. at all. No, and it's, it's passed down yeah. to the children who, yeah. who cannot any more use boats and canoes that they used to use on the yeah. peace. And the, the river boats can't make it through the yeah. debris, it breaks them up. Like the Kylo brothers used to have Rocky Mountain tours, and they said all their boats had to be just yeah. destroyed because... So there's those memories, and yes, yeah. uh, I bring them forth. And Which is important, you don't want them to get lost. Absolutely. Yeah, they won't be lost, no, I'll you tell you, to be <laughs> beneath in. these waters. Yes, um, yeah. Yeah, so, but you know, we all worked in the dams. But here's something that's going to happen in Fort St. John, and it did 30 years ago and it will again. People will say, just a minute, you say that the dams have caused these problems, but look at the jobs that they've brought. Look at the employment. Look at people have raised their families working on these dams, you know, whatever. And I say, yes, businesses are b booming in Fort St. John right now and housing and mm -hmm. people moving in, but they're filling the camps. They don't live in Fort St. John, mm -hmm. a lot of them. 
And also, if you want a perspective, go to Hudson's Hope. Is that a thriving, bustling industrial community mm -hmm. with jobs and businesses and, and a future? Yeah. Ask that question. Yep. Take a look. And will Fort St. John, how long will it benefit mm -hmm. from Site C? And how much damage will remain from that little bit of Absolutely. It almost change. becomes a, sort of a chicken or the egg situation. Did the industry I become, know. and it, it just sort of continues on and on and you, you'd never, you never find a, an exact, exact answer with everybody and makes everybody well, happy. Right. It's difficult. And not right? only the so, reservoir, yeah. it'll, it'll widen the Peace River three times its width yep. and they're now delogging the island. So that's where mm -hmm. the animals come to give birth and stuff yep. and protection from enemies. Those islands are gone. The, they've defoliated the trees. They've done this and that, but also they are realigning Highway 29. Yep. And that is changing a lot of things too across people's property. So well, ev everything. Everything's changing a little bit. Everything changes. You know, man, yeah. humans, when they change nature, have to keep changing it forever to yeah. even find a, an well, even balance, you, if you there will be. You sort of answered it a little bit already, but I'm, I'm curious, is there a, a specific, uh, is there one thing that most people wouldn't know about that these dams sort of change in a way, maybe sort of a, uh, whether it's, you know, the traditional, the ways that, you know, First Nations people do, you know, what they do, or uh, just a way that the dams sort of change things that most people wouldn't necessarily expect that you found through your research, uh, through these books. Is there anything that kind of sticks out to you at all? Or? Well, as I said, the, the fishing, uh, mm -hmm. the mercury that's come into the fish mm -hmm. in Williston Lake, uh, make them non-edible. Okay. That's one thing. The animals, as I say, they their birthing areas are changing, their, their foraging areas of, of the little animals. And oh, they bring all, the, the people have brought up all sorts of things like the spraying of Roundup uh, on transmission lines or uh, in, you know, to deforest. Mm -hmm. As the First Nations people said, you know, when it's sprayed by airplanes, it goes all over. Yep. And what's the answer? They say it's not harmful, but People, a lot of people don't believe that. No, yeah. So there's yeah. so many little things to think about. And what are they doing with this power? Does BC need the power? Does, does BC for its residents need the power? Or do they need it to sell it? Mm. Yes. To whom? That's the question. Many questions. <laughs> there are a lot of questions. There are more questions it. than answers, put it that way. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Shirley, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, I just want to quickly ask you, if somebody wanted to pick up your book, where would they be able to do that? They could pick it up from uh, various independent booksellers, from museums, the Hudson's Hope Museum, mm -hmm. the Fort St. John Museum. They could pick it up from uh, the distributor, which is Alpine Book Peddlers in Canmore. They're the distributor for the publisher, probably through Amazon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just uh, quite a read. It's personal yes. and it's technical. And I've tried to cover the basis without mm -hmm. my opinion coming into it. I reflect yes. the opinions said yeah. to me. Also, I'm giving a reading, uh, a presentation tonight, um, which is Friday uh, at the Hudson's Hope Museum, 7 o'clock, and Good. tomorrow, Saturday, at the Fort St. John Museum at 2 p.m. Beautiful. People are certainly invited to come, and I <laughs> welcome any questions We'd or love concerns to. <laughs> yes. or whatever. That's awesome. Well, Shirley Smith Matheson, your new book is out. Uh, this Valley Was Ours. It's available now, and uh, if anybody would like to pick it up, definitely do that. Uh, for uh, Chet TV's Book Talk, I'm Garrett Holmes. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Anytime.
as they tumbled through the sky, for I saw the riders coming high, and knew what would cry. If the eye thing for us is for kids to feel excited about science, to feel like it's accessible, it's fun and it's exciting, and that it's not something that you only do in the science lab once a week with one specific teacher. It's something that you do in everyday life with objects around you, uh, and it's something that is fun and inclusive and exciting and, and brings joy. I need some help. 